Welcome to Shurka. In this Arctic art episode, we're going to explore Iceland's short but innovative art history through some of the many artists, museums and galleries the country has to offer. Both are in surprising abundance. We're going to tell you about a lot of places you can see here that will bring these stories of art to life. But don't worry, there will be maps, notes and info on the places mentioned in these guides in the Circa app. So just sit back and put your headphones on. This is a story of art by the Arctic Circle. Circa, love the world you live in and we'll help you explore it. Most visitors associate Iceland with its stark and stunning landscapes, volcanoes and geothermal energy, often overlooking the equally impressive art scene. Iceland is a fertile country when it comes to the creative arts. There is an obscene amount of museums, galleries, public art and festivals in little old Iceland. Iceland has just under 370,000 people and as a point of reference, the least populated state in the US, Wyoming, holds just under 600,000 people. How many museums do you think we have here? I'll let you ponder that question for a second. As an art destination, it's a place to explore all of the local gems created and exhibited at the edge of the Arctic. This is where creativity is known to develop in a unique way. That uniqueness may have something to do with the short history of art in Iceland, or its location in between Europe and North America, free to develop in its own way. But before we step into some local exhibition spaces, let's get some context by going way back. When anonymous writers put Quill to calfskin and began writing the Icelandic sagas in the 13th century, they created a new genre of literature. It would later be seen as the arrival of the novel. These 40 or so books used a very straightforward style of storytelling which excluded a flurry of emotions. They were stories of great human tragedy, violence and power in a newly settled country. The style was revolutionary and its influence can be felt in both The Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, to name but two. But then, the creative spark died. And Iceland fell into a slumber following the end of the Viking era. Hardship, due to a cooling climate and foreign rule, were among the elements that had a negative impact. It would take around six centuries and a stubborn artist by the name of Solon Islandus for Iceland to recognize its new artistic endeavor. My name is Svavar Jonathanson, a local guide, radio producer and appreciator of art of all kinds. And I invite you on a creative journey of Iceland. The pain of being an artist. To most people, the name Solon is a downtown bistro which on weekends serves as a nightclub, opposite its hip hop neighbor Prikiv. But for anyone that appreciates Icelandic art, Solon is the name of an iconic revolutionary. It would be unfair to say that no one had nurtured any creativity during the centuries before Solon Islanders' arrival on the stage of Icelandic arts. The National Museum of Iceland has a permanent collection that clearly shows there was creativity in the Middle Ages, but it was limited to the few works of art commissioned by the church, personal artifacts including clothing and carvings on beds, wooden chests and doors. Human creativity doesn't die, but it does depend on fertile soil to flourish. The conclusion is that no one rose up and proclaimed to be an artist. No one made it 
their sole purpose to be an artist, not until Solon Islandus was arrested in Iceland in 1843. He was born Sölvi Helgason in Skagafjörður in the north of Iceland in the year 1820. It's a place renowned for its horse breeding and riding culture, and more recently for incredible river rafting tours on the east and west Glacier River. At the age of 14, Sölvi was an orphan, already having lived four years as a foster child. As soon as he was of legal age, he began a life of drifting around Iceland, offering his creative service of drawing and writing. But the idea of simply choosing where one went in 19th century Iceland, that was outrageous. Iceland was, and had since the 9th century, been a society based on farming with seasonal fishing. As farming was still hugely labor-intensive, it was important to retain workers. This was done by laws known as Vistarpunt, basically serfdom. Individuals had to have a registered place of residence, which in most cases meant working on farms for room and board. The lack of land and the laws that kept people tied as farm workers made sure the population stayed poor. Sölve Helgason was poor, but he would not be tied down and was caught numerous times for roaming around breaking just these laws. He fought any attempts to hinder him and sometimes got away with it, but there were consequences to follow. In 1843, he was caught with a forged document, which he had artistically created, stating that he had freedom to travel granted by the king himself. That is the king of Denmark, then colonial ruler of Iceland. His punishment? 27 public whippings. But that didn't stop his wandering artistic soul. In 1854, he was sentenced to three years in prison to be served in the infamous prison Bremerholmur in Copenhagen, Denmark. Solve refused to submit to the ban on travel, and this is where his art comes in. His defense was based on the freedom to travel as an artist seeking work. He waxed poetic about being an artist and philosopher, eyeing heaven as a residency while exploring the world for inspiration. He was the first person to proclaim himself an artist in Iceland, and he paved the way for all those to come. The man we know now as Solon Islandus was a master artist who drew unique pictures of flowers and giants, as well as brilliant portraits. His tiny, dense and mesmerizing handwriting became works of art in and of themselves. It was a cruel fate that the unjust laws of local serfdom were only abolished after he died. But we are left with his legacy and work in occasional retrospective exhibitions. But for permanent displays, you'll want to go to the National Museum of Iceland, where you'll find them on the third floor. They speak not only of the intricate style of this artist rebel, who had no formal education, nor any exposure to foreign art, but of the hardships and lack of materials in Iceland, where every piece of scrap paper was used and reused. With that, and the story of Sölvi, let's begin our journey through some of the museums, galleries and public art that make Iceland a surprising hotspot for art. Art 101 and the Original Masters of Metal If judged by its small population of just under 370,000 inhabitants, Iceland is bursting at the seams with museums. What did you guess? There are over 400 museums in Iceland. If you combine art, history, botanical gardens and natural history, including 24 proper art museums, there is a large variety of galleries, pop-up exhibitions, art festivals, as well as remote works of art to be found around the country. But we begin where the density is the highest and the variety the greatest. 101 downtown Reykjavik, traditionally the magnet for artists. On the corner of Mimis, Vegur and Freyukata, 
sits one of the oldest museums in Reykjavik. Ásmundarsalur, towered over by nearby Hallgrims Kirkja Church, itself an architectural work of art. But this white cube-like house, which sits next door, traces its origins to one of Iceland's best-known sculptures, who in 1933 built it as a home for his family and a workspace for himself. Ásmundur Sveinsson belonged to the first generation of Icelandic artists. That came as a wave, washing over the Icelandic art scene, as opposed to the trickle of earlier times. Ásmundur was creating art during a time when Icelanders dreamed of gaining independence from Denmark. With that came the need to qualify as a modern society, and that included having art. Although it was an outlier profession in a society where farming and fishing was the norm, those that had talent and chose to commit to art were respected and were even supported by the government. He would later build another house and workspace, now known as Ausmundarsap, in Löardalur, a 40-minute walk or a five-minute taxi ride from downtown. This is the museum that showcases his most famous work. A sculpture garden offers a free view of his softly curved and folk-inspired work, while inside the dome and pyramid-shaped building you find a selection of his work along with rotating exhibitions. The Arabic and Egyptian-inspired living and working space alone are worth a visit. But let's head back to his original house downtown. Considering this was a family home, the upstairs exhibition space takes up a huge part of the building, but in terms of exhibition spaces, it's small. The skylight gives the space an organic feel which seems to suit every type of art hung on its walls. Ausmundasalur is where the most progressive new trends and movements entered Iceland from the 1950s onwards, as well as having served as an art school at one point. Today, it is a space for every type of medium and genre. The downstairs has one of the most cozy cafes in the city, and of course, a stack of local art books to leaf through. Reykjavik is small, and this is a good thing when it comes to exploring art in the city. A wide variety of museums and galleries are within walking distance. A three-minute walk from Ausmundarsalur parallel to the giant church Hallgrimskirkja brings you to another house, also formerly owned and occupied by a sculptor. The art museum of Einar Jonsson sits in a great but impressive modernist building. Built in 1916, it towered over the few tiny houses on the hill. Einar Jonsson was born in 1874 in the countryside east of Reykjavik. He turned to art at an early age and was given a scholarship to continue his studies abroad. Like most Icelandic students seeking further education, Einar studied sculpture in Copenhagen, where he was influenced by the radical ideas of symbolism taking root among Scandinavian artists. This meant that a work of art should represent an idea or an emotion, as opposed to just being a representation of the natural world. His inspiration came from artists like Rodan and Adolf von Hildebrandt. His first artwork to be put up in Reykjavik was Utlein, the outlaw, a powerful statue of a man carrying a child and followed by a dog. It's as if hardships and bad weather surround the statue, even on a sunny day, and if you look closer, the tough expression on the man's face seems softer and almost vulnerable. The statue can be seen at the southwest corner of Reykjavik's oldest cemetery, a 10-minute walk from downtown. We will have a link in the notes. The museum building, where he also lived, stands on the corner of Freyugata Njarðargata, opposite the Café Loki Café. It has an unexplainable weight to it. The architecture is strong and uncompromising, much like the artist himself. He believed artists had a role to play in the development of society by connecting humans to ideas far beyond Earth. 
His inspiration was not only mythological and religious, but cosmic. In my mind, Einar Jonsson's work shares elements with H.R. Geiger, who designed Ridley Scott's alien, Rodan, and especially the Polish-born artist Stanislaw Czukalski, who you might have seen in the Netflix documentary Struggle. There are elements of ancient civilizations and mythology in his work, as well as a softer humanistic representation, featured equally in the surprisingly large museum. While Ausmunter Svensson felt like a local folk artist, Einar Jonsson was the mystical man, the enigma with ideas that came from further back in time and space. It was as if he brought something from another dimension to Icelandic art. But of course, the best way to experience his work is to visit the museum. The sculpture garden in the back of the museum is a testament to his mystical, dark and poetic vision. It's free to enter, but will easily convince you to enter the museum itself. We'll put a link in the notes, of course. Now, let's stroll downtown and visit one of the larger museums in Reykjavik. The birth of the Icelandic Museum. Listasap Islands, the art museum of Iceland, is located by the downtown lake known as the Pond, next to the small corrugated iron church Frikirkan. The museum was founded in 1884, far from the shores of Iceland. Soon after its birth in Copenhagen, the capital of Iceland's former colonial master Denmark, the museum found itself stored away in the attic of the parliament building in downtown Reykjavik, where it shared space with its larger sibling, the National Museum. It finally found its rightful place in 1950 when the modernist White Museum was built, again, sort of tucked away between some of the city's older buildings. Inside the two large exhibition halls, you will discover an assortment of Icelandic art from all periods. This is where you might view a video performance by world-renowned local artist Ragnar Kjartansson playing guitar in a bathtub in a castle, next to the mystical paintings of Master Kjarvar. The museum is not afraid to experiment with presentations from its large collection and gives space to all art that manages to move the viewer. The museum also houses the permanent collection of Icelandic Steina Vasulka and her late husband, Woody Vasulka. Their groundbreaking video art, created in New York in the 60s and 70s, was part of paving the way for experimental video by setting up the iconic art space, the kitchen. Head straight for the basement for a proper deep dive. Looking for art in Reykjavik is a bit like Pokemon Go. It's everywhere, but some are harder to find. Finding the renowned I-8 gallery downtown, next to the ramen place in Trikvakata, is like the starting point of any game. It's easy, and you have to do it if you're gonna play. The reward is art from artists with an international standing, including Ragnar Kjartansson, Ronnie Horn, Birgir Andersson and Olaver Eliasson. They also have a second location at the Marshall House in Grande by the harbor, which is also home to the Living Art Museum. We will drop links like breadcrumbs in our notes. For something a bit less obvious, I recommend an institution that usually deals in a different kind of currency. This place needs to be kept a bit hush-hush, so this is just between me and you guys. In the old headquarters of Landsbankin, a local bank, there are works of art on display that makes you forget it's a bank. A huge mural by contemporary digital artist Sikke Eckert greet the rare customer in a world of digital banking. Works of art from the bank's impressive collection make one wonder if artists could barter loans for art in the old days, or if these are all repo and foreclosure items. The bank owns 70 pieces of art by Iceland's best-known painter, 
Johannes Kjarval, who had a studio across the street in the mid-20th century. Kjarval, who could be called the Picasso of Iceland in terms of reputation and status, had a special relationship with the bank, which lent him money freely and frequently bought his work. Iceland might be a bit different from many places when it comes to the supply of art and who owns it. An auction house and the hotel. Gallerifold is a cultural institution in Iceland. It's the only auction house and synonymous with art collecting. But this is where Iceland differs a bit. Throughout the 20th century, art grew in every shape and form. Like its reputation as a literary nation, art was created by many and enjoyed by the masses. It's fitting that 300 feet from the auction house is the Icelandic Art University and a couple of framing shops. But to have paintings hanging in one's home, mostly landscape paintings from the early to mid 20th century, was not only a privilege of the well-off. My parents once traded an old car for a painting of a horse carcass in the 80s, and my great uncle was given an abstract painting by his employer when he turned 50, which now hangs on my living room wall. An Icelandic auction is light years away from what happens in London, Zurich, and New York. The price tags in Iceland may have quite a few zeros in them, but then again, a cup of coffee costs 600. Icelandic kronas. Although your buying options in Reykjavik include high-end galleries like Berg Contemporary and I-8, Gallerifold is a good starting point for the old classics. And speaking of classics, we need to talk about Hotel Holt. It's no more than 10-minute walking from the heart of downtown, but still it feels hidden away. Its iconic pink neon sign on the third-floor rooftop is a fixture of Reykjavik, but the hotel belongs to a different era. Hotel Holt, along with Hotel Borg, is like the old oak that stands inside the heart of the forest. Behind its unassuming marble tile facade hangs the largest private art collection in Iceland. 1,560 pieces amassed by the hotel's founder and 450 on display. It all began when the owner, Thorvaldur Guðmundsson, was working at a local slaughterhouse at the age of 17. This would have been in 1928. Among the customers was renowned painter Kjarval, or Master Kjarval, as he is often known locally. They became lifelong friends, and Thorvaldur began collecting work by Kjarval, which adorns the seating area of the cozy wood panel bar. The collection also includes many of the best-known artists of that time, this hotel beats any newcomer's attempt to be arty. Staying there is an art lover's dream, and the location does not hurt. Check the notes to book a stay. All aboard the art bus. It's time we go on bus number one from downtown Leikertorg check the notes for info on bus tickets. We have only touched on a fraction of what downtown has to offer, but for now, let's visit two towns, two museums. First stop, Gerðasap. At the bus stop Hamraborg in the outlying town of Kópavór stands a building of brown marble with vertical yellow lines, a glass ceiling in the center, and what looks like metallic waves on the flat roof. It's in good cultural company, with a concert hall and library next door, and was built because of a generous gift in 1977. The 1400 works of art by sculptor and glass artist Gerður Helgadóttir were given to the town by her relatives, on the premise that a museum in her memory would be built. Gerður had been the first Icelandic artist to study in Florence, Italy, in 1949 at the age of 21. She was a prolific creator who left her mark in metal and glass. Church windows, like in Sörbær Kirke, north of Reykjavik, 
and countless metal sculptures are part of her large legacy. Although she lived most of her creative life in Paris, her work and legacy returned safely back to Iceland. The museum opened in 1994 and has since exhibited the artist's thin geometric metal sculptures, along with a wide range of art, in its 5,000 square foot space in two separate halls. It's a museum that embraces the experimental from all genres, including photography. Whatever is on display, you can guarantee to find the work of Gerdur permanently on display in the downstairs space. But her largest art piece is beyond doubt the huge mosaic covering the outside wall of the Reykjavik Customs Building, which is better known as the downtown flea market Kolaportið. After grabbing coffee and cake at the museum cafe, we get back on bus number one. Next stop, Fjordur. The only town that rivals Reykjavik in age is Hapnafjordur, Harbor Fjord. It is traditionally a workers' town with a history of foreign merchants operating there from the 14th century. Its quaint little downtown, excluding the shopping mall, shares in some of Reykjavik's old architecture but with a feel all of its own. At the end of the main street, Strandgata, is the town's art museum, Hapnarborg. It's a former pharmacy gifted to become an art gallery in 1988. It's a place where traditional art, old classics, local artists, contemporary photography, design, architecture, and a pinch of the experimental gets presented. Roughly in that order. This is the quintessential town art museum, where local and traditional art play a leading role. That's not to say progressive and more experimental works are excluded. Autumn shows are known for young curators that shake things up. And the museum hosts concerts on a regular basis with a focus on classical and chamber music. Lunch in the museum restaurant Krit, which means spice, could be followed by a walking exploration of outdoor art nearby. The museum staff will set you on the right track, including an international sculpture garden nearby. How's that for a small town art scene? Art for the people. Here, public art has been deeply rooted in Icelandic society since the early 20th century. The public space is democratic, open and shared, and the right to enjoy art belongs to all citizens. Today that ideal is still manifested in city planning all around Reykjavik and its suburb towns, although with a different focus. But when most of the public art was being installed in the early part of the 20th century, a new city was rising. Reykjavik went from a condensed village to a city in a few decades, coinciding with a nation gaining independence from Denmark in 1944. The massive focus on including art in public spaces was part of building the city from scratch, decorating it with the best things we had, art. The role model for this would have been cities like Copenhagen, where art had long been part of the public sphere. Remember? There was no trove of Renaissance art in Icelandic museums at the start of the 20th century, no marble statues paid for by wealthy bankers. Iceland has no Rembrandts or Da Vinci's in its past. There was woodwork and tapestry in the attic of the parliament building, a long history of poetry, and the memory of Solon Islanders being whipped in 1946 for claiming to be a free artist. The most valuable cultural artifact were the original calfskin manuscripts of the Icelandic sagas, and they had long been sold and shipped to Denmark, not to be returned until the 1960s, arriving on a Danish warship, no less. But at the start of the 20th century, Icelandic artists were part of the building blocks of society, and their work was proudly put on display in the open. This includes the work of Einar Jónsson, Ásmundur Sveinsson, Sigurjón Ólafsson, and many more, 
totaling just under 200 artworks on permanent display. Stroll along the coastline of the capital city, along Cyprus, for a view of a more modern, metallic representation of a Viking ship that also speaks to further human exploration, titled Sun Voyager. After a visit to the Living Museum at the Marshall House, take a short walk past the giant fish factory and discover the Mound, an experimental art structure by the harbor that cleverly summarizes Iceland's history at the top. Also, for further art discoveries, download the Reykjavik Art Walk app developed by the Reykjavik Art Museum, which of course is a must visit. The Artists at the Edge of the World Every country in the world has artists that create in isolation, under the radar. From 1921, Simon Rodia worked alone for 34 years to create his iconic masterpiece, the Watts Towers, in L.A. Almost a century before, a mailman named Ferdinand Cheval had spent 33 years building his dreamlike castle, one pebble at a time, hidden away in the French countryside of Hotterives. Iceland also has its fair share of such hermit artists, two of which stand out. We begin in the West Fjords, in a place that feels like the edge of the world. At the tip of one of those distant fjords is the valley of Selortalur. It's a six-hour drive north of Reykjavik and 40 minutes from the nearest village, Biltutalur. Here, at the edge of the Arctic Circle, artist Samuel Jonsson began creating his own fantasy world based on photos he had seen from the famous Alhambra Castle Fortress in Granada, Spain. His three children had all died young, and shortly after moving to his final place of residence in 1947, he lost his wife. This is when he began making his lifelong dream a reality. He was already in his 70s when he began to mix the concrete for his own lion's fountain, paid for by his meager pension. Samuel Jonsson built his fountain, a church, house, and sculptures in what would be termed naive art. Something that people would say, I could have made that, or better yet, my six-year-old could have made that. His dedication and DIY spirit has earned him an endearing place in the nation's heart, and the stories of his perseverance will leave no one untouched. It includes laying a path of white seashells down to the beach when he began losing his eyesight. This way he would not get lost when fetching rocks for his art. Samuel Jonsson is known as the artist with a child's heart. It should be noted that Selardalur is a summer-only destination. Husafell, on the other hand, is both much closer to Reykjavik and attracts visitors all year round. The attractions include the strange waterfalls of Hraunfossar and a man-made ice cave on top of a glacier, reached by driving in a giant former NATO missile launcher, a proper Doctor Strange love journey. And let's not forget the recently developed hot spring pools located inside the canyon and the underworld of Vidgelmir lava tube. We will have links to all of these places in our notes. But it's the creativity and land art of local artist Patlo Husafelli that brings us to this charming valley at the edge of the highlands, two hours north of Reykjavik. His name is synonymous to his home, as he is known to all as Patl from Husafell. A place his ancestors have inhabited for centuries, and Patl has called home most of his life. He studied sculpture in Germany in the 80s, after being inspired by the many artists that had sought inspiration from Husafell. His choice of location is far from remote. His workshop, standing at the edge of a parking lot that leads to a popular canyon trail behind his house. But 
It is far from the epicenter of the Icelandic gallery scene in Reykjavik. His work is mostly stone sculptures made from local stones. Around this workshop, and even scattered around the local countryside, are large rocks of various sizes with faces on them, resting on the ground as if refusing to leave their natural place. Patl is a part of the landscape he creates with and in. But his work is far from limited to his home region, which covers both the forested valley and the rocky barren highlands nearby. Chicago, the Faroe Islands, Switzerland, and dozens of places here in Iceland present the work of an artist whose energetic creativity has led him to live alone so that he can focus all his time and energy on his art. Pautl also paints paintings, but his biggest creation has been heard by millions. His unique stone harps, made with local slabs of stone Pautl collects, brought him to the attention of local band Sigurós, which he toured with around the world playing it. In Husavet, he has a 30-foot-long stone harp, played with large wooden mallets, something that has brought bands like Muse and Radiohead to his doorstep. If you're lucky, Pot will be around, and the doors to his gallery open, where he might even play you some Bach on the harp. But if he happens to be wandering the local mountains for inspiration, or carrying rocks beyond most men's ability, not an uncommon situation, at least take a peek through the window. Husafetl and its surroundings is a destination for anyone wanting to experience art outside of the traditional gallery space. Staying a few nights in Hotel Husafetl, which prominently displays Apotl's work, makes sense for many more reasons than art. For one, it's a great place to see the northern lights in the winter. It has lava caves, ice caves, hiking, hot springs and the Icelandic rarity of a forest and a great restaurant. Alternative accommodation includes a campsite, in summer of course, and a variety of local cabins and bungalows, which you can find on Airbnb. Sixty-two hours of hell in the highlands. One of the more incredible tales of outdoor survival is that of farmer Stefan Jonsson, who would later become an artist and local curiosity on the streets of Reykjavik. But long before he began creating art, he had to fight for his life. Stefan left his family farmstead in Mödrudalur on foot on a cold February morning in 1936. Mörudalur lies at the edge of the highlands in the north of Iceland, midway between Lake Mývat and Egilstær in the east. It's not only remote, but it's the highest farm in Iceland, which can make for extremely cold winters. Stefan's destination was the valley Jökudalur, or Glacier Valley, 24 miles to the east, where he was delivering the mail. After three nights spent at various farms, Waiting out a storm, he made his way back with some parcels, a bicycle tire, and a few sheep. Darkness set in, and Stefan was forced to hunker down for the night. His only refuge was a boulder, and the snow he could manage to build up around himself. The shelter partly protected him from the biting cold wind, but his body heat melted his frozen clothes and made everything wet. Navigating proved hard as the storm hit any features in the landscape. Short glimpses of dark rocks, mounds or mountains were not enough to confirm his location. He soon decided to leave the sheep. They refused to go any further anyway. He had lost his outer gloves, his pants were torn and his knees bloody. The temperature was zero degrees Fahrenheit and Stefan was bleeding from his mouth and nose. The dog warmed his feet at night a well-known survival trick in Iceland, as well as singing to keep from falling asleep, which would mean certain death. No one was looking for him. His family thought he was waiting out the storm in Jökuldalur, but after spending 62 hours 
scrambling in torn shoes over mountains and rocky terrain, he stumbled towards the barn where his brother was tending the sheep. He stood inside the barn to slowly warm up before entering the extreme heat of the house where his hands and feet were put into cold water, the proper way to treat frostbite. After a big shot of alcohol, he was able to recount his ordeal before falling asleep. It turned out the parcel he was carrying contained a set of woolen trousers. But Stefan maintained the mailman's code of ethics and never opened it. He had begun painting at an early age, but it was not until he moved to Reykjavik and took a painting under the artist named Storval in his late 60s that he became known. He was a strange figure in Reykjavik, wearing a captain's hat, a medal, and bursting into song in an unusually high-pitched voice. He was as odd and honest as his paintings, which he often prized by the number of horses they had in them. But his most iconic paintings are of the mountain Herdebreith, which dominates the northern highlands where he fought for his life. It is said that his ordeal changed him and made him, well, a bit strange with his high-pitched, almost childish voice and sudden bursts of song. He was part of the cultural landscape in Reykjavik and is remembered fondly. He was extremely prolific and sold his paintings cheap in the 70s and into the 90s. They are now collector's items fetching a high price. Although you are more likely to see his paintings on the walls of Icelandic homes than in museums, there are a few places you can spot a Storval painting. Head to Café Laugalekur, close to the big swimming pool in Reykjavik, where one of his mountain paintings hangs. Why not have a warm cup of coffee and pay tribute to the artist who survived 62 hours of inhumane, freezing conditions and lived to immortalize the queen of Icelandic mountains, Herdebreith. For anyone that would like to experience staying in a turf house cottage at the painter's old farmstead in Mördalur, check the link in our notes. Art in the East Art thrives all around Iceland. The regional town of Isafjörður in the West Fjords nurtures galleries, local artists and festivals between the steep, tall mountains. And Akuriri in the north has a world-class contemporary art museum known for pushing the boundaries. But there are towns where art is part of the fabric of a place. Surrounded by steep mountains and the Atlantic Ocean, the small village of Djupivor in the East Fjords has become a breeding ground for new artworks by Icelandic and foreign artists. The most prominent is the row of giant marble bird eggs lining the waterfront, each a precise replica of an egg of a certain local bird. And art keeps hatching in this village, which world-renowned local artist Sjöru Guðmundsson, the egg maker, calls home. An old rusted fish tank has become the site of many performances, art pieces, and international collaborations. Djupivor is a seaside village that focuses on slow travel, belonging to the international slow movement, or Sita Slow. So take your time in Djupivor to eat, relax, and enjoy some art. But for a town that has art in its DNA, you're going to want to make your way up the East Fjords. Through the town of Eilstadir and drive down one of the most scenic roads in Iceland, leading to the village of Seydisfjordur. This is as close to an artist colony that you get in Iceland. Visiting from Reykjavik is not a day tour, as it's an eight hour drive. Going this far east means Seydisfjordur should be part of a tour around Iceland, unless you fly from Reykjavik to the region's main town, Eilstadir. Staying in Seydisfjordur is definitely worth it for anyone exploring the small local art scene. Formerly the home of world-renowned Swiss artist Dieter Roth, who settled in Iceland in the 70s, 
it has gained popularity amongst artists from near and far. The yearly art festival Lunka, held in July for the last 21 years, is a chance to experience an atmosphere of creativity and surprises, as people let loose ideas in both formal and informal settings. Performances, art shows and every form of creative expression all have a place in this beautiful fjord. Iceland has an art scene that has grown exponentially in the last hundred years, in every possible direction and genre. After centuries of cultural stagnation, where poetry would work on church doors and wooden food bowls were among the few outlets, creativity now flourishes. As opposed to the limitations and punishments Solon Islandus faced in the 19th century, artists in Iceland have a lot of freedom, opportunity and venues to present their work. There is a DIY spirit in Iceland that is shared across all cultural fields. This manifests itself in the countless small galleries, including Galeri Null, or Ciro, in the former public restrooms at the bottom of Bankastræti in Reykjavik, where artists host their own exhibitions with a fast turnaround. Exploring the art scene in Iceland is not limited to a small number of must-see museums, but a constant discovery, whether in the capital, towns, villages or remote desolate valleys. It entails wandering the streets of Reykjavik, hunting for murals of local artist Sara Riel and Hong Kong artist Kara To, whose ode to mother on Main Street Laugavur will blow your mind. But it also entails keeping your eyes open for the unexpected, like the polar bear with a shopping cart under the bridge of the Glacier Lagoon, believed to be a work of Banksy. Iceland, as an art destination, spans a short history, but makes up for it in quantity, quality and Icelandic originality. Thanks for listening to our Iceland Arctic Art episode. Check out the other episodes in this Iceland guide for more on Iceland's unique food, its wild weather, and a story about two murders that rock this peaceful nation. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or download the Circa app, where you can also get pictures and maps and notes on this episode and more. Maybe you'll want to sample our guides for New York, Hawaii, Mexico City, and many more to come. Circa, love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it.